And good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for tuning in today for this special webinar, tackling the great resignation in accounting, how to attract and retain talent in the accounting profession today. I'm very pleased to welcome you to this webinar on behalf of Smith Business Insight and CPA Ontario Center for Corporate Reporting and Professionalism. The center was established at Smith School of Business at Queen's University, thanks to the generous support of CPA Ontario. Please note that closed captioning for today's webinar is available using the button at the bottom of your screen. My name is Bertrand Malch and I am an accounting professor at Smith. I will be your host for today's event. The great resignation is affecting all industries and sectors today, and that includes accounting. What are the specific causes of people leaving their jobs in accounting now? What are the best practices to retain and recruit top talent? And how does the remote work trend both hurt and help your chances of keeping people on your team? There's lots to talk about, and we have an amazing panel today to discuss. So let me briefly introduce our speakers. First, uh, Erica Pimentel is an assistant professor of accounting at Smith School of Business. Her teaching focuses on financial accounting and her research explores how technological disruption impacts the ways in which auditors engage with their work. She's a CPA and CA and worked in public accounting before entering academia. Bijan Tufigi is a partner of MNP's Assurance and Accounting Group in Toronto. He specializes in providing assurance and accounting advisory services to large and medium-sized public companies. He is also a CPA qualifying at CA and is involved in educating the next generation of accountants as a university instructor and through a variety of CPA Canada initiatives. Finally, Tina Dacin is the Stephen G. R. Smith Chair of Strategy and Organizational Behavior at Smith School of Business and also the Principal Investigator of the Community Revitalization Research Program. Professor Dacin teaches on leadership, change and strategy and she advises and speaks to major corporations across numerous industries. Her research has been published in top management journals and she has been awarded for both her teaching and research. As you can hear from these profiles, we are in very good hands today. After today's presentations, we will have time for a Q&A session with our panelists. I encourage you to ask questions. You can write them into the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen at any time during the webinar. So let's get started. First up, I'd like to have Erica Pimentel present on remote work and the great resignation in accounting. Erica, the floor is yours. Uh, thanks, Beltran. Let me just share these slides, get them started. Here we go. So just can I, can I someone confirm that they see my slides correctly? Okay. You can see just, can you see the notes? No, okay, it's all great. Thank you very much, Beltran. All right, fantastic. So in this next section, I'm going to provide some reflections on research that I've been working on about how accountants are changing how they work due to the pandemic. So over the last year and a half, two years, I've been checking in with accountants both at the beginning of the pandemic and again at the end of last fall to understand how their practices are evolving as the pandemic is taking hold and how their work is changing. Um, and my goal is really to report on this and then understand, well, what can we do about it as we're seeing this phenomenon of the great resignation take hold? So let's get started. So when I first started my interviews, I was really amazed actually at how quickly accountants had responded to the restrictions imposed by COVID and how quickly they had moved online. And by and large, accountants were able to really easily move their work online because the nature of accounting work is amenable to being done remotely. And so auditors actually, by design, had always been working remotely when they worked in the field and at their client site, and so they were really used to being mobile. And of course, firms had to upgrade their tech infrastructure, so they had to buy, I don't know, Teams licenses or invest in new connectivity software, but the tools were there, they just needed to be amped up. And so from an accountant's perspective, a lot of what they were doing before could be done now remotely with little to no reduction in the quality of their work. The change was really from the client's perspective. And so clients see these remote audits happening and they're actually less disruptive and cheaper because they don't have to pay for the auditor's um, travel fees. And so 
my respondents are telling me that we're likely to continue to see fewer client visits now that we know a lot of this work can be done remotely. But one of the things that's changed in how accountants work is really how staff relate to one another. And so for one, communication patterns have changed dramatically. And it would seem that the way accountants communicate in firms has changed to what my respondents call a calendar culture, meaning that everything's scheduled. And so, you know, while there could be occasional back and forth by email or Slack messages exchanged, it's really harder to have a spontaneous, substantive conversation with someone. And so how people exchange information, for instance, to change an audit procedure or to look at if certain expenses should be claimed, that tends to involve a calendar invite, a Zoom meeting, and it tends to be far more formal than it was before. And so this has an immediate impact on how we train and supervise junior staff, right? One of my respondents said to me, well, when I was sitting in the audit room, I could tell by the look on someone's face if they were struggling. But now when they're working from home, I can't see what they're doing. And so it becomes very hard to provide that ongoing feedback, that ongoing mentoring, which is fundamental to the experience in an accounting firm. And so this means that junior staff isn't learning as much. They're not learning as quickly. And they're trying to experiment and figure things out on their own without necessarily direct supervision, which is fundamental to how accountants work. So what some firms have tried to do is implement what they call virtual audit rooms. So folks will sit around at home and either have a Zoom meeting on all day with the camera on or camera off to stimulate or simulate that connection that was possible when working in an audit firm. But this has been met with mixed success, especially with regards to privacy issues. So my research has found that when we see all these changes happening, the ways in which accountants experience work has changed across four primary dimensions. So the first is communication style. So when communication happens in the context of this calendar culture, communication becomes direct, focused, and transactional. So there's less time for coaching, mentoring, the types of human interactions where one could check in on their staff, remind them that they're a valued member of the team. And so that type of personal check-in needs to become more intentional. And when we stop being intentional, that's when employees start feeling disconnected, undervalued, and really start looking elsewhere. The second change is self-presentation. So before I became an academic, I worked in practice for many years. And to this day, when I get dressed to teach, as I am today, I say I'm wearing my auditor costume. And so this is really different. I juxtapose this against a story one respondent told me where a client came to her, to her home to pick up some papers and she was wearing her pajamas. And the client looked at her like, what are you wearing? And she thought to herself, well, oh, what am I wearing? And she said to him, well, anyways, you're hiring me for my brain anyway. It doesn't matter what I look like. And this idea of you're hiring me for my brain, what does it matter what I'm wearing came up several times. And it's, it's a bit silly, but more fundamentally, what we're seeing is there's this deeper dimension of decoupling people from their work. So we're hiring the person's brain, we're paying for their brain, we're not paying for the whole person, we're not paying for how they feel necessarily when they go to work. And so I see these changes in how we present ourselves at work, um, as reflecting this level of depersonalization caused by working from home. We don't see the people that we're working with. The next is how does work fit into our life? So of course, working from home has created massive levels of flexibility. So of course, you know, you can do your mid afternoon yoga, pick up your kids early, this is all wonderful. But at the same time, we're also finding that work is stretching to fill the amount of time available in a day. And so when, work or the office exists at an arm's length away, it's always just available the moment you open your laptop screen, we find that every home space can become a workspace. And this has the potential to lead to burnout, overwork, something I think Tina will talk about a little bit later. And finally, because working from home necessitates a bit of home and a bit of work, it can be quite revealing uh, about another person's life. And 
allow colleagues to see sides that they didn't know about before uh, of the others. So I remember one um, senior manager telling me that he was on a call with all the partners in his group and the partners talking about some very technical accounting treatment. And he's there making eggs for his kid. You know, he's there with his frying pan, he's making his egg. And the, the respondent said to me, like, I didn't even know he was a hands-on parent like that. I didn't even know that side of him. And so it's really interesting how, despite the shortcomings of online communication, of feeling like we're in Zoom all day, we can see into each other's personal spaces and capture these very personal sides of our colleagues. Now, of course, this has the potential to also go the other way when folks find they're not getting enough real FaceTime and they're only getting these small managed on-camera interactions. So all in all, we're seeing that the way accountants experience work is changing. We're seeing work expanding to fill the time available. And we're seeing a bit of a depersonalization that comes from just communicating through screens where we're missing some of that human connection. That really, in my view, makes working in a firm rewarding and exciting. So altogether, this is leading to what we're seeing, what we're here to talk about today, the great resignation. And we find that accountants are working harder and longer than ever before because of the blurring of lines between work and life. And so this has a massive impact on our personal life because we're working all the time. Now, look, working a lot in public accounting is not new. Those of us who've worked in practice will know busy season is hard, it's demanding, and yet we do it every single year, year after year. The problem is that working long hours alone is not the same as working long hours in a team-based environment that is the bedrock of accounting firm culture. And so my interviewees are telling me that working from home has taken away all the fun stuff or the perks that made long hours worth it. Rather, the accountants are left to their spreadsheets alone for hours on end. And as one person told me, they've just taken all the fun out of the job. And so a lot of work with few rewards leads to massive turnover. And when folks are asked, why did you leave your job? They're saying, by and large, they're burnt out and they're leaving without even another job lined up. And so now that we understand some of the features that are leading to the great resignation, what can we do about it? Now, one thing that we don't need is another Zoom happy hour. Let me tell you, my respondents do not want one or another Uber Eats gift card. What they want is a substantive effort being put into letting them know what they, that they are cared about, that someone is concerned about their well-being, that someone is concerned about their progression with the firm. They don't want to feel forgotten or marooned on some remote working island. So let's dig a little bit deeper on what can we do. So I'm gonna provide four tips on how accounting firms can respond to the great resignation, focusing on how each of these can link to the broader critique that employees feel that sort of that no one cares about them, that they were forgotten at home uh, on the other side of the Zoom screen. So the first is implement what's called the stay interview. And so the stay interview has been around for a long time, but it's gained appeal during the great resignation. And so think of it as the opposite of an exit interview, where you sit down with your existing employees individually and check in on them and, and, and ask about them. How do you feel about your place in the firm, their future in the firm, where they want to go? So common questions are, what makes you feel good about your, the impact of your work? What do you want to do more? What do you want to do less? If you could take the role on of your direct manager, what would you do differently? And so the purpose is really to make employees feel heard, have a finger on the pulse of issues before they arise. And this doesn't need to be something that happens every year, but I think as folks are returning to work in person, this might be the moment uh, to have these intentional conversations with them, with employees. Well, you might tell me, well, Erica, we really don't have time to do these stay interviews with all of our staff in the near future. Okay, so focus on the folks who will be most difficult to replace or those who are top performance. Who would it really hurt if these, like, it would hurt the most to lose? And so, Employers should hone in on these individuals and make sure they're being offered the growth opportunities and recognition that they desire. So this could mean, oh, you're coming back. Let's offer you a training course now that you're back in the office or pay for them to upskill. Something to make top performers know they're on management's radar, even if they're not being seen in purpose in person. Um, 
Also providing flexibility where possible. So despite the drawbacks of working remotely, like isolation and burnout, a recent study found that 76%, let me repeat that, 76% of employees do not want to return to the office full time. So the major reason employees want to continue re working remotely is flexibility and the ability to improve their work-life balance. Now, that doesn't mean they don't want to return to the office at all, but my respondents are telling me that they would like to work in some type of a hybrid way where they can work from home at least part of the time moving towards a hybrid workforce. The problem becomes, well, then what makes us special? How do we maintain that workplace culture when folks are working from home? And I think that's what really made it difficult is that secret sauce of what makes EY EY or what makes KPNG, KPNG is really, really apparent in person, but harder to distinguish online. And so I think what firms need to ask themselves is what matters to your organization? What makes your firm special? And don't tell me it's the people because all firms say it's the people. What really makes your firm distinct and experienced differently by your employees? So if inclusion is really important, then think about how you can hire differently and how you can integrate remote work into attracting a different talent pool. If training and mentoring is important, how can online tools be used to foster these types of relationships? Whatever it is that makes your organization unique has to be intentionally implemented into and reproduced into these new uh, hybrid workplaces to make sure that the online and in-person experience create a consistent working environment for employees that delivers on what firms expect of their employees. Now look, I'll admit, I'm sort of drunk on the Kool-Aid that I believe life in the firm can be very rewarding and can be a phenomenal place for someone to start their career either and then move on to stay in public accounting, to go into industry, to go into academia. And I think there's a lot that firms can do to attract and retain talent to demonstrate how rewarding this profession can be. But let's talk to professional in the trenches, uh, Bijan, who will reflect on his, what he's seeing as a partner at MNP. Let me just bring Bijan on now. All right, Bijan, thanks for being with us here today. So let me just get started um, by asking you, what are you seeing? What trends are you seeing regarding accounting firms' ability to attract and retain new staff? Thanks, Erica. I think you were kind of alluding to this as, you know, during your presentation, but, you know, the market itself has become increasingly competitive in the last few years. So this is both, I would say, at the new staff level and at the experienced staff level. So um, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but there has actually been a significant decrease in students coming out of university entering into accounting profession. And uh, the, when I saw the numbers, they're, they're quite substantial. Like it, it's very noticeable. And, um, you know, this trend actually started before COVID, but I, I think many things during COVID kind of further kind of exacerbated that and, and uh, you know, kind of escalated to, to move even faster than it already was. And are you seeing the same trend for experienced staff or is it really those junior folks are not coming into the profession in the first place? I actually think, uh, you know, again, before, before COVID, um, we were already seeing this at the experienced staff level. I think at the, you know, okay. the one to two, even one to two years of experience, um, we, we were seeing those challenges in kind of the, the marketplace. And I actually think this is, it, it's a big testament in terms of actually how great the CPA designation is. Like people with the CPA designation and even those with just a few years of experience are really highly sought after in the market. And so there's a lot of opportunities out there for those individuals with just a few years of experience. And, uh, you know, that's making the competition fierce at the experience level. And I think always at the staff, like the junior staff level, we didn't really see that competition. But uh, in the last year, certainly that was more prevalent for, for all of the firms. I'm going to ask you to speculate for a moment, Bijan. And so as we're seeing these trends, what do you think is is causing folks to not go into accounting in the first place? Or why are we we're not seeing the levels of interest that we had before? Mm -hmm. So I'll kind of take it from two angles, one at the firm level, maybe one also at the general profession level. I think at the firm level, I do think there were, you know, uh, uh, I, I guess we've been kind of a combined sort of CPA profession the last, uh, you know, 10 years or so now, but there were some decisions made at the profession level that, that did impact the firms. and. 
it took a few years, I think, to see that impact. I think historically, you know, when I was getting my CPA, when you were getting your CPA, there was really only one route to get your CPA, right? Um, you know, you had, you had to go to a firm. There were some options out there, but they were rather limited. I would say today, uh, you know, you could get your designation in a lot of different avenues. So from a, from a competition perspective, uh, the accounting for so suddenly out, when you're coming out of university, there's just so many options out there. So, so I think that's number one. And I think that we've definitely seen that impact more prevalent in the last few years at the firm. Um, you know, I do think there is, uh, you know, as kind of the, you know, Gen, Gen Z and new generation comes up, I think there is a different attitude uh, on, on work and work expectations, flexibility, these kind of things. And, and you know, I'll speak a little bit about this later, but um, like the probably we as a profession need to do a better job marketing in terms of, you know, letting people know the, uh, the all the positives and all the benefits of joining the profession. Um, you know, certainly when I was in school, there was sometimes like a stigma with the firm. And, and, and I think we haven't done a good enough job as a profession to maybe market um, to, to the new generation about, you know, the strong benefits of joining. So I think that that that's part of the reason. And, and I think finally COVID, uh, as you know, you alluded to, I think it definitely increased this. I think, um, you know, certainly when I was at the junior level, one of the most the fun aspects of the job was the social aspect. Uh, you know, all, you know, you have so many people at your level, um, even people outside of your team, like the social impact was, it was very big. It was very big. And, you know, in a, in a, in a very remote environment, you do strip some of that away and all the firms are trying their best. Um, but at the end of the day, there is that so, sort of social element at the staff level that uh, people love. And, it, you know, there, there's not a lot of workplaces out there where there are so many people of your age doing like similar roles as you. It's a very, it's a very cool environment to work in. And, and sometimes in that COVID and virtual environment, it, it is hard to replicate that. So I, I do think that that has also maybe um, caused some of this. And, and then finally, uh, and another kind of good thing for the profession, like I said, the demand for accountants has increased uh, significantly <laughs> in the last few years. Um, I know certainly when I was, in, even when I was in school, there was like talks that, oh, demand for accountants will go away, will be automated away, we're going to be replaced by AI. And I can say today the demand for like CPAs, accountants, it's never been stronger. And I would say, especially during COVID, uh, the public markets were booming. Uh, and what happens when the public markets were booming? More companies were going public. People were raising money. There was a significant demand for accountants, lawyers, uh, you know, bank uh, investment bankers. All these sort of professionals were highly sought after. So you have this huge spike in demand, and then you have the supply issue. And you know, basic economics will tell you when you've got a big spike in demand, you've got those supply issues. You know, the, like supply of people coming into the profession. It's just going to escalate the problem further. So I think there are some good things where people want the the, the world needs CPAs. They're in high demand, but um, you know there are some things that have, have obviously challenged the profession in the last year or two. Yeah, I worked with a partner. He said EY was a school, and I really felt that you know that it was a really great place to start my career. Um, not that I'm I'm pushing EY here or anything. I just I feel that the route through the profession was incredibly rewarding and set me up for a, a career in academia that has been very rewarding. Um, so now in your role at MNP, can you share some best practices uh, on how to attract and retain staff? Like anything that you guys found is working? Yeah, I, I think one, one thing for sure, and you, you mentioned this and you know, the percentages of people who wanna work remotely, uh, you can't run away from that. It's, it's like, you know, you said over 70%. Uh, I mean, and, and as I speak and spoken to staff anecdotally, um, they do like working remotely. And, and, and I think you need, we need to continue kind of to give that option. But at the same time, I, I don't think the, you know, the, I'm hoping that the in-person elements won't go away. And I think it's very important for those kind of reasons that, that uh, I had mentioned. But um, one of my, you know, I, I also do a lot of interviews for, for people kind of leaving their firms. And, uh, and I, I talk to a lot of individuals. I think what team members are really wanting is they want consistent exposure to the partners and managers they work with. That is something that I hear time and time again. And, and you were alluding to this where this kind of calendar culture has kind of come to fruition. Uh, and you can understand why in, in this remote environment, but um, I think these days, 
like top talent has become more valuable than your top clients. And, and as a partner groups and manager group, you have to realize that that. So I, I think, you know, for me, like I, I do have sort of the scheduled touch points with the team, but uh, I do make a concerted effort to actually not have my calendar too, too full to actually allow the team to have those sporadic kind of calls, like the, the ability to call me at any time, the ability to kind of try to simulate that open door policy in a remote environment, I think is very important. Uh, being able to just, you know, message your team quickly. But I think the availability and that constant feedback from the partners and managers, I, I think that's what gets the teams, uh, team members kind of respected. And, and I think that consistent communication goes a long way. And I think uh, basic empathy, especially sometimes in the remote environment, um, you know, you sometimes don't see the person as, as they are. And I think realizing you are working with an individual, that basic empathy is going, um, is, is very important. And I, and I think uh, we've seen people leave the profession and, um, I'll say that in the last few years, uh, you know, when I, when I was kind of getting into public accounting, it was taboo to leave during busy season or right before busy season. And now I would say at the profession level, it's actually become quite a uh, common practice. And I think the reason for that is that it's not, people don't feel uncomfortable doing that because they don't necessarily feel connected with some of their, their team members. So it's like, well, um, I'm doing what's in my best interest. I don't really know the person on the other side of the computer, perhaps, so you don't feel as guilty. And so I feel like, um, you know, having that, those trying to emulate those connections. I know for me, I still have a lot of lunches with my teams in person, coffees, uh, those go a really long way. I think that's really, really important, Bijan. And when we forget that it's a person on the other side of the camera and we just see, it makes it really easy to leave when you don't care who's signing your paycheck, if it's just a person signing and I don't really care about the firm. So let me just get you one last question, Bijan, before we uh, turn over to Tina. Um, so what role can universities play in all this? How can we better promote the profession and life in the firm to our students and make it attractive to them? Yeah, I, I would love to see just more kind of connection, connecting uh, with the like, you know, firms and universities in a meaningful way in the future, like through, um, you know, even just like having some professionals come in for like half a class or just guest lecturing, inviting them in and just getting individuals more exposure. Uh, I know when I used to teach at university, I, I think one of the, you know, what scares people sometimes about the firm is they hear about these long hours, they hear about the stigma, um, but they don't hear about the benefits, right? They don't, they don't mm -hmm. hear about the, the culture you get, that you get to work with so many people. It's like, it's like an extension of school in your first few years, the training that you get and more of that long-term outlook of what it can really yeah. do for your career. I know when I was in, the, in school and, and there, you know, even when I wasn't at the firm anymore, actually, I, 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 I often, if someone came to me and they were a type A personality and they were looking the other way, I would say, hey, like you have the talent to go very far why don't you try it out? Like try it out for, for a few years. If it's not your cup of tea, you're going to learn so much from it. So it's more just, um, you know, reminding students about that long-term view and the benefits and not just sort of those, those negatives that you sometimes hear about. I think there's, you know, there's a reason I'm still here today. I would actually say the opportunity at the accounting firms have never been better. Like the opportunity for growth and promotion, like um, if you play your cards right, you could get uh, promoted and do very well and, and much quicker than you could before. And, yeah. and that's because of that demand and uh, because of all the opportunities out there. So, that, so not just showing you know, the, the negative, but also all the positive benefits. I think the universities can help with that. And I think having a, you know, a, a, I think having a strong kind of public, you know, from the accounting firms, it also helps the profession because it is a good training ground for the profession as a whole. Yeah. So I think it is very important for the profession as a whole, not just the firms to, to have that uh, kind of pipeline. Yeah, I, I, and I think your, your point is well taken. We're kind of an ecosystem. We're all part of the profession together and making sure students understand the positives and the negatives. So thank you, Bijan, for your comments. Um, we're gonna turn now to Tina. Um, uh, Tina Dason, professor at Smith and our resident uh, OB expert going to talk to us about the great resignation. So Tina, if you want to turn on your camera, welcome to bring you on. Uh, I'd love to, but it says I can't. Oh dear. So it says uh, I'm unable to. Sorry. Okay, there we go. Perfect. Fantastic. Okay. Great. Thank great. you. It's Thanks, nice Tina. to have that control back. There we go. All right. Great. 
So as I turn it to you, the first thing I'm going to ask you is from your perspective, why is all this happening? So, I mean, we've been having such a great discussion. So I think some of it's already been touched on a little bit, but one of the things we used to do was try to keep our work and our personal life separate. We were told when we go to work, we work, when we go home, it's our, it's our own time. And what the, has happened in the last two plus years has been this fusion of work and personal life. And I think that's caused a lot of folks to reassess. So reassess their own personal relationships, to reassess their relationship with work. What is it that they want from their employer? And I would say that also to reassess the importance of time. And now what we're seeing is that for many employees, their relationship with work is somewhat fractured. I see folks tired. I see them stressed. I see people trying to manage everything, but also weighing what's important a whole, whole lot more. So the words that really spoke to me, the two words in the last uh, half hour have been deliberate and intentional. Those two words are really important. I think employers need to start working with deliberation and with intentionality in how they treat their employees. I'll give you just one very quick example. I have a colleague that works in the other part of the university and she was telling me that her boss called her at the start of the pandemic and said, look, we're all gonna have to work from home. What do you need? And it was insane because she said that some of her colleagues needed just uh, a printer. Others asked for a standing desk. Others said they needed paper and pens. I remember walking around Shoppers Drug Mart at like 10 p.m. one night thinking it'd be safe to go in so I could buy office supplies that I didn't have at home. But just the fact, again, that in this department, their department chair took that initiative to do that is really, really huge because it shows employees that you care and that you care mm -hmm. about each of them individually, not as mm -hmm. one monolithic group where everybody is going to be treated the same. Yeah. I, I think that's wonderful, Tina, that individual attention that people haven't had and then they feel all by themselves. I think that's what we need to do if people are coming back to the office uh, in person. And one of the things sort of in the same vein that you've spoken about extensively is the four day work week mm. that firms could adopt as a response to the great resignation. So could you tell us a little bit about that and how that would work? Right, so, you know, four day work week is touted um, and has been gaining popularity and mindset over the last um, you know, year or more, longer actually, because it's been an experiment in several places. I would say what's happening in addition as an over layer or a meta layer to the four day work week is that we're coming up with new forms of work. So that's a huge change. And as you mentioned, you know, folks are wanting to do hybrid work, but what we're having is face-to-face -face work, hybrid work, and then re complete remote work. And I think what's happening now is that this versatility in what we have to now demonstrate to our employers that we're good at working in each and every zone. This sort of multimodal work, as Sedal Neely, she's just written a book on remote work, would say, yeah, this multimodal nature of work is going to drive a lot of things. So what's happening is folks are looking at the four-day work week as another opportunity to think about retention and avoiding the great resignation. Here's the dilemma with that. I think some organizations are not going to get it right. Compressing 37 or 40 hours into four days is going to make people more stressed, more burnt out. In some places, what they're doing is they're actually saying, let's take um, 32 hours a week and compress that into four days. And if we do that, you can have seven or eight hour work days, but employees um, may work actually less but they'll be more productive and because they'll be happy. And so you'll have less stress, greater productivity, increased company loyalty, and uh, stronger well-being. But now this is going to cost firms money. So this is that right. tension and that trade-off we have. Do you do it across the board? Do you do it for a certain set of employees? Like you mentioned, you know, top talent. And then what happens when you go and ask people, what do you really want? Maybe people don't want a four day. Everyone doesn't want that. Some might want five days or six days. So then where does the issue of overtime come in? 
And how do you offset that? Maybe some folks want flex vacation days in the year, take them whenever you want type thing. And so how do you work all these nuances? And so I think the logistics of rollout is what's going to be super, super interesting. Not whether a four day is good or bad. Used to be, um, we all worked six days a week if you look at the early 1900s. So the five day is, not, is more of a recent, I guess, relatively recent phenomenon. That's very interesting. So we're, what, if I understand what you're saying, it's the flexibility that people got from working from home opened up all these new avenues for just figuring out where work fits in your life a little bit differently. Yeah. All right. And, and so people like work, but not that much. Maybe. Right. <laughs> yeah. Maybe that's it. Maybe that's it. But this crowd, I can tell you, likes working a lot. Yeah. Um, and, and you, I mean, you love what you do, right? You become a professional and we could talk about identity and how work fits into your identity, but that's a conversation for another right. day. Um, so let's say a firm wanted to start and implement the four-day work week. Where do they start? So I think it's starting with your employees to really probe and see if this is a, a good idea, if this is something that they're open to, something that they'd like. I mean, maybe they're leaving for other reasons. So I think one of the things that came up is what's an industry effect versus what's a firm effect? Are there some firms that are doing better than others in keeping their employees? And so we need to look at that to see what are they doing that's, that's better. So I would start with employees first to find out what is it that they need and what is it that they want? What is it that they're looking for, right? And it's super, super important to bring them into the conversation early and then co-create how something would roll out. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And because otherwise you might have a solution that that doesn't fit the problem that right. for your organization or as we know, accounting work is very seasonal. Uh, you know, what happens in January to say April or if you do tax until the end of June might be different than what happens in the second half of the year. So I, might, I mean, if you were to say, okay, this is a great idea. We're going to implement flexibility. What would you say is the, the biggest advantage uh, that would come out of implementing a work week or these type of flexible approaches to time in the workspace? Yeah, so, so turnover is costly. Turnover costs a ton of money to organizations. And so what you would have, I think the biggest advantage is increased company loyalty. You'd have people feeling like the organization is in your corner. And that's what I think a lot of people need right now when we find low morale in organizations and we feel that people are exiting is that they don't feel valued. They don't feel that what they do is valued. So I think that actually a huge benefit would be company loyalty, that we would feel loyal to that organization. And that's so important. And especially as Bijan was alluded to before, when your skills are highly marketable and highly transferable from one organization to another, this loyalty component becomes so, becomes so important. Now, my only, to, be, to play devil's advocate, I wonder whether we're gonna, we could expect to see a lot of resistance to this idea in accounting firms, because this is so different from some of our audience, I'm sure will have worked in firms that had blitz days on the weekend when everyone comes in to do the tax returns on Saturdays during tax season. Four-day work week is a big, you know, jump from there. So what types of resistance do we expect to see and how can firms overcome this resistance? Well, you've got two things happening. One is at an industry level, there's a professional culture that you look at the field of accounting, you know, you have a certain, certain sets of behaviors, norms, assumptions, values that carry through. And then you have firm culture at the other side of it. And I think changing both of those is really hard. You're gonna to have to change the incentive system for any of this to play out well. I think you're going to have to, you know, when you change incentives, you change behavior. And something Bijan said was really, really interesting. I read a study years ago that asked um, junior lawyers in a firm, uh, what are the two things they really wanted? And they thought it would be make a lot of money and rise to partner. And in fact, they did say, the respondent said rise to partner, number one thing. Yeah, they wanted to achieve partner. But the second thing was spend time with the partners. And so Bijan mm. is right there, right on, because I think it happens in accounting and law firms. We look for that human one-to-one -one connection and mentoring. It's so powerful and valuable. 
but we undersell it. And we don't realize that now working at home for two years, there's a lot of people who aren't getting that. And so I actually think there are going to be some people that may be seeking out face to face and the return to work. And we're not talking to those folks either a lot. Mm -hmm. We're talking to the ones that want to leave, but we also should be talking to the ones that want to go back and want to stay because they may be craving that and some of that interaction and mentorship. This is so powerful, such powerful advice, Tina. It makes me think of apprenticeships and how apprenticeships started with you would work with an experienced person in your field and get and learn everything they know. They teach you everything they know. And that's uh, we've, we've moved a far way away from that. So thank you, Tina, for your insights. So yeah. uh, Beltran, maybe you can come now and we could come on now and we could take some questions from the audience. Uh, I see quite a few are piling up. I'll, I'll hand it over to you. Yeah, thank you, Erika. Thank you, Tina. Thank you, Bijan, for your amazing um, insights and this great conversation that is, you know, you, you can see from all your, your, your uh, thoughts that it's a very multifaceted problem that cannot be addressed, you know, in a, in, in a unique way and it required a lot of uh, different approaches, I guess. Um, so I, I guess, so of course, like, you know, to the audience, feel free to uh, keep uh, posting questions in the Q&A button. I will try to do my best to get uh, to them as much as, as many as possible. Um, uh, so I will uh, perhaps start with a full question for um, Erika and Tina, perhaps more specifically, but Bishan, of course, feel free to, um, to jump in. Uh, so I think both of you mentioned the idea that in some sense, firms, employers should start being much more proactive and go check on their employees and ask, well, what do you need and what do you want? And But what if you can't give them what the employees want? So what does happen? You know, what is the next step? Like, you know, so yes, so I hear you, but you can, so, so and this was a very interesting question. What, what happens when, if the feedback is not acted on, is the request is not acted on, if the demand is not acted, so are you creating another, a bigger problem? Because then you created expectations. So I just wonder about that. Tina or Erica, feel free to. Tina, I'll let, you, uh, Tina I'll let you start. Tina, I'll yeah, let you start. So, on that one. so I find this really interesting because are people going to feel thwarted when you don't deliver? So you ask them what they need and then you don't don't give it to them. So one of the best um, techniques that I've seen in this space when you can't deliver and you can't give everybody everything they want is you actually say, here's what I can do. And here's what I cannot do. And that's when transparency comes in as a really important core value to exemplify and to show people that this is what I can do. And I found this in the government, for example, where there's a lot of bureaucracy for things um, like how much vacation you can have and things like that. But people informally started to create systems of loo days or, or flex days or things like that for folks. But you know, telling folks, here's what I'm able to do, but no, I can't change your pay, but here are all the other things I can do. So I think honesty and transparency goes a long way. I, I, okay, Tina, I couldn't agree more. I, I couldn't agree more with that in the sense that it, you can't, there's no way to, that you can raise everyone's salary, $25,000 and, and cut their work week down to four days and do all these things. But it's the intentionality. It said, I, I heard you. And I think people just want to be heard. And you can say, listen, I can't give you monetary compensation, but I can give you something else instead. And how you negotiate those trade-offs while making sure, however, that they're inclusive and consistent. Because there's nothing worse than finding out that the person in the cubicle next to you is making more money and working less hours than you are and these feelings of inequity happen. So I think there, there needs to be some transparency to Tina's point about these negotiations. Yeah. Bijan, do you want to add something? Um, no, <clears throat> I'll, I'll just say, yeah, I, I think uh, being heard is the most important thing. It, it's, you know, you, you try your best to deliver, but I think the action of still getting that, that being heard is, is sometimes actually the most important thing. And, and then you, you, you work with what you can do. So the, um, you, sh you know, you shouldn't be afraid to, to not listen because you can't deliver and everything. The, the first step is to listen and you just go from there. So I, so I, I, I hear you, uh, transparency is certainly um, 
you know, important to help this, uh, I mean, to make this work. But uh, I guess my follow-up question then is, I think uh, also, Eric and also Bijan, you mentioned, you know, the importance of sort of, you know, targeting your top talents, the one you really don't want to lose. Um, and then it sort of implies that you will treat them a bit differently and give them more in a sense, right? Or, you know, uh, and then there is, and then I guess, so the question is, how do you manage uh, transparency and fairness in a sense? And how, what, what happens for those not top talents who are still important for your firms, for your teams? Um, how do you reconcile, you know, the tension, you know, in terms of, yeah, again, like, you know, growing this, growing these talents, the, the ones you want them to succeed and also keeping the rest of the team on board at the same time and probably knowing that they talk to each other, right? So when you give some, something to someone, probably at some point, uh, the others will know they don't get it too. It, it, and it, it's not necessarily material, you know, Bijan, you mentioned, you know, and Tina also, you mentioned attention, time. You know, uh, the way you allocate time as a resources to your team, you know, might might be so. So, how do you manage, you know, transparency with the um, the demand for um, fairness and the, the focus on top talents? I think the you know, um, I, I think as the progression grows, I think that top talent will just become more and more valuable uh, as things become more competitive. I think. The interesting thing about top talent, usually top talent in an accounting firm, there's kind of these type A personalities. They're not necessarily coming to you to say, I want less work or I want, like, they are actually, some, sometimes that top talent is asking for opportunities because they're so ambitious that, you know, you're actually, you, you would offer it to everyone else, but they're always kind of willing to go the extra mile. And then you sort of, you provide that extra. Sometimes not everyone wants that. And, and, and that's what you sort of need to recognize. And one of the things when you're kind of fostering that top talent is that they need to kind of, what you're doing for them, they need to push those same values to everyone else. So it's like a, I call it like a trickle down effect. If you do that for two, three people at the firm, but you make it clear that they need to do the same uh, across, you, you'll kind of foster this environment where everyone is sort of getting attention because now your top talent is giving attention to a lot of other individuals and, and, and hopefully that kind of environment spreads. But it's not that you're ignoring <laughs> your uh, other individuals. I think it's more, um, you know, just understanding what everyone's needs are and trying to work with those needs and, uh, you know, trying to just spread that positivity and make sure that everyone is providing each other time. It, it is something to balance, but I, I think usually, um, you know, if someone is really willing to put it in and they're not top talent, you still give them the time and they'll, and they'll get there. And so you kind of let them sort of dictate what, what they want in their career at the end of the day. And, uh, Everyone sort of has their own kind of work tolerance of what they want to do and what can't, but it, it's certainly something hard to to manage for sure. I would agree. I, I, think, I would say that. Oh, please go ahead. No, go ahead. I was just going to say that I I don't think that by giving some people opportunities because they want to work harder is unfair to other people, right? If if like firms generally have these very established performance evaluation systems where someone will get a three and someone will get a four. And so the person who gets a four gets a higher raise. And so as long as you're transparent in how you came to those determinations, you can give more money, more opportunity to certain people, as long as you're transparent in how you establish those different things. Um, and I think it also comes down to what types of opportunities you provide to different people. So I'm sure when Bijan was coming up uh, the firm, they gave him the hardest mandates, the longest mandates, because that's what he wanted. And that's what he needed to make partner fast. Someone else, that's not appealing at all. They want to maybe be put on, I don't know, uh, a, uh, the, the recruitment team, maybe that for them is an opportunity. And so when we start seeing our employees as individuals, to Tina's point earlier, then we can have these conversations about maybe you don't want every stretch opportunity. And to you, making your life very happy at the firm is how can we keep you in those 40 hours, let's say. So I think it really comes to having these individual performance plans or um, expectations really at the individual level that are discussed with the individual coaches. Yeah. So, I, I would, oh, sorry. Go ahead, Tina. No, it's fine. 
No, no, I was just going to say, like, at, like, the firm level, there's no, the, the thing is, there's actually no shortage of opportunities, especially, you know, I'm thinking of, like, at MNP, I don't, I, I don't think anyone would ever say, no, you can't take on that, but it, it's, like, do you have the bandwidth, do you, you know, is, is this something you really want to do, because if you're going to take that opportunity, it, it's going to be more work for you, so I think that recruiting example is a very good example, Erica, a lot of the times, uh, I'm very, very uh, I'd like, kind of, team members to be more involved in, sort of, our recruiting process, and everyone, it's, it's an opportunity available to everyone, but at the same time, it, it doesn't come without, you know, if you're going to put in that time, that, that's more time that you're going to have to spend, right? So not everyone was willing to, but, you know, those type A's and who really want to do it will take the opportunity. So I think one of the good things is, I think there's no shortage of opportunities at the firm. So if someone really wants it, it'll be available to them. Yeah, so I was just going to add that I think, I agree with making evaluation criteria transparent, but the access to opportunities needs to really also be transparent and available widely, because in some organizations, the opportunities are limited, and in other organizations, they're widely available for the taking. And so it's when people start to feel that they don't have equivalent access, they may feel someone else got more mentoring or more consideration. That's when you start to see the culture of an organization deteriorate and fall apart because then you get internal grumblings about why did so-and-so get that opportunity and it wasn't posted or things like that. So I agree with Erica about the need that if you are going to talk inclusion, you actually need to live it as well. You need to show that that's available across the board. Um, perhaps uh, uh, moving to um, another um, topic, which is more related to the remote work situation. And I will just copy back the question because it is very uh, well written. So. Uh, how do you reconcile the feeling of missing out by not being in the office with the evidence that people don't, don't want to return to the office at least full time? And so can you speak to this? I guess, you know, we are, as human beings, we are full of contradictions, but, you know, we love the social, but we love being at home too at the same time. So how do you make this work? And I guess potentially part of the response is hybridization, but still like, you know, are these two mutually exclusive groups, is there a way you can address, should be like a free for all buffet where you choose, you know, you know, the amount of time you want to be, you know, what is, I guess one way to reformulate. So what is the amount of flexibility you should give to your employees? Like, you know, should it be a lot from, from 0% to 100% working whole more at, at, in the office, Tina? Wow. So I think, I think giving folks the flexibility is always a good thing. Um, but I think that uh, there could be, I think one way to play it out might be to say, I'm in the office Monday, Wednesday, Fridays, like people need to have an expectation. So if I want a face to face meeting with someone, I might be able to have some predictability of when I could reach them or where they're going to be. That's the thing I think is that it's a little bit chaotic. I mean, have you tried going on Teams sometimes? Because everybody's listed as green, but they're not there. They don't answer the call. And so you start to wonder then, okay, um, what's the other system by which I can reach people or connect with folks? And I think that's where the glitches are gonna come and need to be logistically smooth out. But I think giving people the flexibility, maybe even to say, spend one, maybe two days a week, where, wherever you want to be and letting them make the choice. But I think for clients or for colleagues or coworkers, peers, you need to be able to know when you can expect to reach someone and get an answer to your question. Thanks, Tina. Erika, Bijan, on this reconciliation of contradiction. I, I think the open com the communication is very, very important. I'll, I'll give you an example where, you know, I know a lot of my team members right now, they, they love working from home, but, uh, you know, I also know the benefits of kind of working here. So I kind of asked them, I said, you know, um, you know, we, we kind of have this engagement coming up. I think two days in the office would be fair. You guys pick which two days do you want to come in uh, as a team and, and, and you, you pick it and, and you let me know. I'll be here every day, <laughs> and, and, but you, you pick whatever days work best with you. Um, you decide and, and, and you know, it, then it's not like one person on the team is here on one day, one is another day as a team, you kind of decide what works best. And I think just that open communication, I, I think really helps. I think uh, 
like I said, um, I don't think the remote work uh, is going to go anywhere. I, a lot of frustrations I've seen, not from what I've heard, not what I've seen personally, is people are asked to go to work and then they're asked to just be on Zoom calls and team calls all day. So it's like, well, why were you asked to come to work? So it's like, it makes sense if it's more from a team-based approach, especially in the, the uh, public accounting. Um, it's like, I can't ask, it's like, oh, I want all my team members come in and then I don't show up, right? Then like, well, why did, why did you tell me to come in, right? So I think you just need that open communication as a team. Um, and, um, you know, I think it's gonna be an interesting dynamic where, um, you know, will there be opportunities for people that uh, are in the office sometimes? Probably, because, you know, one of the interesting things in, uh, is, Sometimes when you walk around, sometimes team members will have access to people they would not usually talk to on their teams and something organic could come out of that. That's, that's just the reality of life, right? Like in terms of, um, so that's why, you know, just, just having that kind of balanced approach where, you know, maybe in the future they come in a few days, I think they need to know the opportunities, uh, benefits, pros and cons of each side, and then they can make the decision that makes most sense to them. Thank, thank you, Bijan. So I may want to, to go to another question because we're running a little, a little bit out of time and I want to ask this question, which I think is uh, important and perhaps in the mind of uh, some people in the audience and actually someone asked it in the, in the Q&A. So, um, so I, I wonder, so again, like, you know, touching, uh, approaching this from another uh, dimension, um, is, is the great resignation, especially in the... Um, in the, the field of accounting firms, a question of compensation and money. And that's something, you know, that, you know, because when you go to, I mean, you know, you've heard all of these stories and we, which are not just stories, you know, you go on forums, you know, and you see, you know, when you try to explore a little bit the reasons why you left, you know, in many cases, it's actually related to uh, a perception that compensation was not adequate. Uh, so is it a money problem in short um, and, if yes, then what do we do from there? And if not, then what, what do you do to change the perception that it is not a money problem? Uh, Tina, Bijan, Erika on this question. I get to punt question. that one. I get to punt yeah. that one to Erica. So we have, I think that it's part of the conversation. We can't ignore it. And we have the sal seen the salaries come up quite a bit in the last recruiting season. Um, from what I heard, the re recruitment salaries were gone up like $15,000 for a junior. And then you have juniors making more than intermediates. And, who and then everybody's salary has to go up. So at some point, and, and I know Bijan is going to give me a look at me crooked, like you want the firms to pay their staff more money as a partner. It, that doesn't sound so good to you, but, you know. At some point, we have to recognize that when people are working all the hours they're working and the, the market will dictate higher salary, especially because when I talk to my undergraduate students, they're like, well, why do I go into accounting? I could go into marketing. I go into finance. People with their degree from Smith can go anywhere. And so, yes, I agree. Compensation is part of it. But in my own experience, the life in the firm was a tremendous socialization into the, into the profession. It taught me how to work. It taught me how to work hard. And I learned skills that I can't put a dollar on. But I can say that now reflecting on the experience. But I do agree that increasing starting salaries in the profession is part of it. And also maybe changing the compensation arrangement. Like maybe people don't only want money. Maybe to many of Tina's points, compensation is like a full package. If I take, yeah, you know, maybe I'm making 10,000 less than somewhere else, but I have better long run prospects. I have more flexibility. I have a better pension fund. All in all, my compensation looks really good going into a firm. And when I factor in all these different things. Bijan, a quick, quick thought on this. Yeah, I think at the end of the day, you know, I think it's all going to be dictated by the market. I, I mentioned supply and demand. You've got a huge spike in demand. <laughs> You've got the supply going down. Uh, I, I don't. It is what it is, right? Like in terms of, and, and I think Eric alluded to it, the compensation did go up quite significantly in the last year. And I don't think some of that moved in 10 years. <laughs> like, uh, you know, for 10 years, it was the same starting salary that I got until for like six, seven years. And, and you know, um, I think that was part of it. The, the mar market dictates it. I think there's a lot more than that. I think uh, historically, you know, every year you worked at the firm, 
uh, people had the long-term vision of what that meant for you uh, in terms of getting your skills up, and it probably will increase your long-term earnings potential quite significantly. But um, when people are not coming into the profession as, as much, uh, it is inevitable. And you know, we've seen the fee increases on the other side for, for clients. It's, it's much more expensive today to get accounting and services uh, from a client perspective than it was a few years ago. And it, it all kind of trickles down at the end of the day. So. Okay, so um, thank you very much, uh, Bijan, Erika, and uh, Tina. We uh, are uh, running um, out of time. So I want to uh, conclude again by thanking uh, all of you uh, for your participation. Um, and um, I uh, wish you uh, all the best. Thank you.